The ocean floor is still when you see a small, beautiful shell while wading through the shallow water. You don't know it yet, but this shell can and will kill you. And this isn't a metaphor for some drawn-out illness or infection it carries. It will happen within minutes. The cone snail is one of the most dangerous animals on the entire planet. And while I didn't think I would ever have to actually be afraid of a snail, just a single drop of cone snail venom contains enough conotoxin to kill over 20 full-grown humans. Which means about 0.029 milligrams of this venom is enough to stop your heart. For reference, this is how big that amount is compared to a grain of table salt. You're cooked. Even the world's most venomous snake, the inland taipan, has an anti-venom. There's nothing for the cone snail venom, which means if you get stung badly, the clock just ticks. Why did evolution make cone snail venom so deadly? Why is there still no anti-venom or cure for its sting? And could nature's most exact death tool on the nervous system actually be the key to saving lives? To understand how cone snails are so deadly, we have to first understand how they hunt. A cone snail can strike its prey in just 200 to 500 milliseconds, about half the time it takes you to blink. This little clownfish here barely noticed the snail when it was hit. It twitched for a second before getting swallowed by a snail. It may look like a quick kill, but in reality, there's a whole mess of biology working behind that split-second shot. At first glance, cone snails seem to be like any other ordinary land or sea snail. They're slow, about six inches long, and tucked inside a pretty spiral shell. You might spot one half buried in the sand and think nothing of it. Just another harmless grazer minding its business. But that's where the resemblance ends, because unlike other snails, cone snails aren't herbivores. They're carnivores, and simultaneously assassins. Their entire body is built for one thing, catching fish. Their shells are hard and smooth, kind of like a tiny submarine hull. It protects the snail from getting eaten and lets it hide under the sand without much fuss. It acts as a snail's fortress, and it's shaped to fit snugly into crevices and bury itself almost completely. This way, the snail stays out of sight, like a sniper waiting in a foxhole. Like most snails, the cone snail moves by sliding along on a big, flat muscle called the foot. It's not exactly a racehorse, more like a slow crawler. It glides across the ocean floor at around a couple of centimeters per second. That might sound like a snail's pace. Well, because it is. But it's enough to quietly sneak up on prey without spooking it. Looking at its head, the snail has two little eye stalks sticking out. Don't get your hopes up though. These eyes don't do much. The snail can tell light from dark, but it can't really see anything in detail. So how does it actually know when a fish is nearby and available to inject with venom? The snail uses a little tube called a siphon, sort of like a snorkel, but it's the snail's secret weapon. It breathes through it, sure, but more importantly, it uses the siphon like a super sensitive nose. The snail sucks in water and tastes it for chemicals, picking up the faintest hint of fish swimming nearby. This sniffing ability is how it finds its prey without seeing it. When the cone snail locks onto a target, usually a fish hiding near rocks or coral, it gets ready to strike with its built-in harpoon. It's a tiny venom-loaded radular tooth that works like a hypodermic needle on a spring called a proboscis. When the snail's ready to attack, it shoots the tooth out at lightning speed. The tooth is barbed like a fish hook, designed to pierce through the scales and skin. The moment it hits, it injects a powerful venom cocktail that paralyzes the fish in seconds. And this venom isn't just any poison. It's a carefully mixed blend of dozens of different toxins that mess with the fish's nervous system, making it impossible to move. So even though the snail can't chase the fish down, it doesn't need to. The fish basically freezes, helpless, stuck in place. Once the fish is immobilized, the snail reels it in by pulling back the proboscis, like winding in a fish line. Then it slowly devours its prey, all while staying mostly hidden under the sand. The siphon still sticks out, a quiet warning sign, don't come any closer. Honestly, just thinking about the poor fish makes me want to scoop them up into an aquarium. It's a scary world for them down there, when even the snails are trying to eat you. 
The net feeding cone snail plays a very different and frankly, way more terrifying game. Look here, it may seem like a simple snail with something like a net sticking out of its mouth and a fish just sucking into it. But what's actually happening here is a full-blown biological warfare. Instead of launching a direct attack, it releases a chemical cloud into the water, a mix of venom compounds scientists called the Nirvana Cabal. Sounds peaceful, but it's basically a fish-stunning gas. The moment nearby fish breathe it in, their muscles stop cooperating. They get sluggish, confused, and just kind of vibe there. It's not full paralysis, but more like someone hit pause on their reflexes. That's when the snail makes its move. It stretches out the proboscis, almost like a slow-moving vacuum hose, and just scoops the fish in. The fish can't even swim away, so there's not even a chase or a fight back. And then, once the fish is close enough, the snail still fires its classic harpoon to finish the job. Paralysis kicks in fully, and the fish is toast. The whole thing is less hunt and kill and more stun the whole crowd and pick off whoever's floating by. And honestly, it works disturbingly well. But these are just small fish. Which cone snails are the ones actually capable of hurting us? Turns out, scientists have identified over 800 species of cone snails, and that's just the ones we've named so far. Some say the real number might be closer to a thousand. All of them belong to the genus Conus, and every single one of them produces venom. Every single one. But not all of them are built to kill fish. Some cone snails stick to hunting marine worms or other slow-moving snails. These guys still use venom and harpoons, but their venom is specialized for small, soft-bodied prey. They don't pack enough punch to hurt humans, unless maybe you've got a shellfish allergy and decide to lick one. Don't do that. Out of the 800 plus species, only about 10 to 20 are built to go after live fish. These are the ones you don't want to find hiding in your dive glove. Their venom is fast acting, neurotoxic, and extremely efficient, designed to stop fish mid-swim. And unfortunately, it works just as well on humans. The most infamous of these is Conus geographus, also called the geography cone. This is the one with actual documented human deaths linked to it. It's big, beautiful, and armed to the teeth, literally. Geographus is also the best known net feeder, meaning it can take down multiple fish at once before firing the kill shot. That makes it not just dangerous, but kind of terrifying on a design level. Other heavy hitters include Conus chilipa, Conus striatus, and Conus magus. All are fish specialists, and all carry venom strong enough to seriously mess you up. And it's not just about the harpoon. Some of these cone snails, like the geographers, use that Nirvana Cabal strategy we talked about earlier, releasing a venom cloud into the water to sedate multiple fish. It's chemical warfare with zero warning signs. One second you're a fish, the next you're sliding backwards into a mouth. Most species are found in tropical and subtropical waters, especially in the Indo-Pacific region. Think Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Northern Australia. If it's sunny, salty and full of coral, chances are there's a cone snail nearby. Some live in the Caribbean or along East Africa. A few can be found as far north as the Mediterranean. But the most dangerous ones, they hanging out where you'd book a snorkeling tour. And if you get stung, pray the doctors know what they're doing. Because that's the most frustrating part about cone snail venom. We don't fully understand it. We're not even close. Cone snail venom isn't your average animal venom. It's not like a snake bite where you rush to the hospital, they inject a known anti-venom, and you're on your way to recovery. But with cone snails, there is no anti-venom. If one stings you, there's nothing to neutralize the poison directly. So doctors focus on supportive care, basically keeping you alive while your body fights the venom. That usually means helping you breathe with a ventilator if the venom paralyzes your diaphragm, monitoring your heart, and managing symptoms like pain or muscle weakness. Eventually, the venom breaks down and gets flushed out. And until then, all the medical staff can do is hold your line. It's not that scientists haven't tried, it's that the venom itself is just almost evil. See, cone snail venom isn't a single poison, it's a cocktail of them. A mix of dozens, sometimes hundreds of small proteins called conotoxins. Each conotoxin is like a precision-engineered molecular weapon. 
Some target nerves, some block calcium channels, others shut down muscle contractions or paralyze the diaphragm so you stop breathing. Even more troubling is the fact that every species of cone snail makes its own custom blend. That means over 800 different species, each with a different venom recipe, with different targets in the body and in different combinations. Scientists estimate that across all cone snail species, there could be over 100,000 unique venom compounds. You just can't make one anti-venom for all cone snails. You need hundreds, maybe even thousands of antidotes, each tailored to one specific mix of proteins. And we don't even know what most of these proteins are. Some of them degrade in minutes, others are so small and so complex that they fly under the radar of current lab tests. And even when we do isolate one, figuring out what it does and how to counteract it is a whole separate nightmare. It's a puzzle with thousands of moving parts and the pieces keep shifting. This is called nature's combinatorial chemistry. The cone snail doesn't just evolve new venom over time. It reshuffles its molecular deck constantly, producing slightly different toxins for different situations. Some are meant for fish, some for worms, some terrifyingly seem to work on mammals, including humans. But how does a snail decide which venom cocktail to use on its prey? Why does one species paralyze instantly while another shuts down organs slowly over hours? Turns out the answer might be even stranger than the question. There's growing evidence that some species can vary the cocktail depending on the situation. A fast-moving fish might trigger a quick-acting paralytic response, a slower crustacean, something more methodical, maybe even a toxin that numbs the area so the prey doesn't struggle while it dies. We still don't know how cone snails regulate this. We don't even know if it's conscious, automatic, or triggered by prey type alone. What we do know is that no other venomous animal on Earth seems to wield this level of pharmacological precision. Cone snails don't just kill, they tailor the kill. The most notorious of them is, of course, Conus geographus. Locals call it the cigarette snail, because according to legend, if it stings you, you'll only have time to smoke a cigarette before you're dead. And it's not far off the truth as well. So far, about 36 deaths have been linked to cone snails, mostly Conus geographus. One sting and there is no chance for you. It's one of the most venomous animals on Earth. The worst part is you probably won't feel a thing at first. No pain, no sting, just a weird tingle. That's the venom already doing its job. So where does that leave us? Modern anti-venom research works best when there's a clear single toxin with a known target, like cobra venom, which is dangerous but relatively well studied. Cone snail venom is more like a shotgun blast of biochemical tricks. You don't know what hit you, you don't know what to counter, and by the time symptoms appear, you may already be fading. Some researchers have tried developing anti-venoms for specific cone snail species with limited funding. After all, how often do people get stung by Conus geographus? But then, something caught the expert's eye. Nirvana Cabal. Yes, remember how net-feeding snails like Conus geographus release a venom cloud? That cloud also contains a unique form of insulin. Unlike ours, it's fast-acting and ultra-compact, evolved to cause immediate hypoglycemic shock in fish. But in humans, that same property might be a breakthrough for managing type 1 diabetes. Scientists are now studying synthetic versions of the snail insulin, hoping it can deliver rapid glucose control with fewer complications than current insulin therapies. And this isn't just theoretical, it's already in preclinical development. What started as a desperate search for antivenom turned into something bigger, a possible clue to diabetes treatment. But that doesn't just stop there. Cone snail venom is a molecular gold mine. Take Conus magus, the magician's cone snail. Its venom gave us zirconotide, marketed as Prielt, a powerful painkiller used for patients with severe chronic pain. We're talking next level stuff. Unlike opioids, zirconotide doesn't cause addiction. It doesn't build tolerance, and it doesn't affect the reward centers of the brain. But it does have one big catch. It must be injected directly into the spinal cord. Not exactly over-the-counter treatment. Still, it's a start. 
Researchers have since identified hundreds of conotoxins, each targeting specific neural pathways with surgical precision. Some bind to ion channels that control pain. Others interrupt muscle signals or shut down involuntary reflexes. It's like nature reverse-engineered the nervous system. And now, we're trying to copy it. Some conotoxins are being tested for epilepsy, aiming to silence the abnormal firing patterns behind seizures. Others are being explored for Parkinson's, where selective neural modulation might help restore motor control without the side effects of traditional drugs. But the real excitement lies in how targeted these compounds are. Cone snails don't use brute force toxins. They use elegant, modular chemistry. As I told you guys earlier, each species has its own blend. Each venom is a custom-tailored molecular cocktail. That makes conotoxins perfect candidates for precision medicine, especially for diseases involving the nervous system, where broad-spectrum drugs tend to cause more problems than they solve. There's even talk of using cone snail peptides for cardiac disorders, autoimmune diseases, and targeted cancer therapy. One compound under investigation blocks specific calcium channels linked to chronic inflammation. Another might help regulate neurotransmitters in patients with severe anxiety. None of this was designed for us. Cone snails evolved this chemistry to kill fish, not cure humans. But the overlap, how closely their peptides match the receptors in our bodies, is what makes them so valuable. Their venom acts like a cheat code for bioengineering. Of course, turning a marine neurotoxin into a safe human drug takes years, maybe decades. But every clinical trial moves the needle. Every peptide mapped is a potential cure. So while this still is the deadliest snail in the world, it just might be the snail to save us. If you enjoyed this one, check out this video about a starfish duplication infestation.